Take a look at the t-shirt you're wearing, or your jeans, or even the money you have in your pocket. I'm Scottish, so I don't have any to show you, unfortunately. But all those things are made of cotton. Yeah, the dollars and euro bills too. Well, I have some bad news to tell you. One in five of you may be wearing a product made by slave labor right now. This, unfortunately, is pure mathematics. A quarter of all the cotton in the world is produced in China. But within China, 88% of the cotton crops are grown in the Yingjiang region. And if you're a regular follower of visual politic, you'll be aware of what is happening right now in Yingjiang. Discrimination against the Uyghur people, re-education camps, and forced labor. Okay, back to the math. If a quarter of the world's cotton is produced in China, and of this cotton, 88% comes from Yingjiang, we only have to make the rule of three to find out what percentage of cotton is produced in this region, where the Uyghur minority is practically enslaved by the Chinese government. You don't even have to get out your calculator because I'm going to tell you. It's 22%. Yeah, that's right. 22% or just over a fifth of all the world's cotton that we all like so much is the product of forced labor. And it's used by big brands like H&M, Adidas, Ikea and Nike. And in case anyone thinks it's not a big deal, Brace yourselves, because this is not the worst thing. China is not the only country that is covering up human rights abuses in cotton production. And although it may be hard to believe, there is something even worse than forced labor. Check this out. The nimble fingers myth is particularly relevant to cottonseed production, where employers claim that tasks of cross-pollination, emasculation, and hand pollination are best undertaken by prepubescent female children, as is the case in India. ILO, International Labour Organization. Yeah. That's right. In the 21st century, there are still producers who publicly argue the benefits of child labor. And let's be clear, we are not talking about teenagers, but about children who start work from the age of five. They are also very often employed to pick cotton because compared to adult pickers, they have two advantages. One is that because children are shorter, they don't have to bend down to pick up the cotton. And two is that they can be paid much, much less than any adult. So if you are an unscrupulous business person with no government control, the best thing you can do in your cotton field is to enslave, I don't know, an entire school? And I was saying that as a joke, but there are countries that do exactly that. When the fall comes, they take students out of the classroom to go and pick cotton. And you're probably thinking, so in this video, we're gonna talk about terrible things, right? Like modern slavery and child labor. Because if we are, Grant, I need to go make myself a cup of tea if this is going to be one of those ones. But the truth is that we are not. Because in the midst of this very bleak situation, we actually have some good news. Forced and child labor in Uzbek cotton fields continues to fall, ILO. So now you will say, so what's the point? If you remember, in a visual politic video in which we talked about Uzbekistan, we said the country was run by a wild, abject dictatorship, and that it had no scruples about enslaving its population to pick cotton. And, in case anyone was wondering, the same dictator who ruled then is ruling now. We are talking about Mr. Shavkat Mirzoyoyev. And I might have gotten that name wrong, but he's a dictator, so who cares? In that respect, nothing has changed. The Uzbeks continue to suffer under a regime that considers human rights to be, at best, optional. And you might ask, then how is it possible that, all of a sudden, this dictator has had an attack of conscience and he's going to end both forced and child labour? Has he been visited like Scrooge by three Dickensian ghosts and realised that he has to change his ways? Well, not exactly. So why has Uzbekistan decided to eliminate forced and child labour? How is it doing it? And to what extent can it serve as a model for other cotton producing countries? Today, we are going to answer all these questions. And before we take a look at some history, I just want to tell you about our new channel, Visual Academy. From the coast, the Spaniards penetrated and began to- It's covering all the most interesting people, places, and periods in history with some great animation. And I can only assume a very handsome sounding voiceover guy. And that man's name was Genghis. Can. You should check it out. And now, let's get cracking. It's everywhere! It may surprise you, but cotton is one of the 10 most widely planted crops in the world, behind wheat, corn, rice, soybeans, and some cereals. Around 2.6% of all cultivated land on the planet is planted in cotton. That's about the same surface area as Germany or Poland. 
Furthermore, as you know, unlike wheat or corn, cotton is not eaten. But even so, it occupies twice as much land as, for example, potato fields. What's more, up to 300 million people, or almost 3% of the world's population, work at some stage of the cotton production chain. And you're probably thinking, but why do we need to plant so much cotton? If in principle it's only used for clothing, and not all clothes, because there are also clothes that are made of linen or hemp or a myriad of other fabrics, then that might be true. But it turns out that cotton is used for pretty much everything in life. Take a look. This five euro bill is actually pure cotton. Think about it. If the bills were made of paper, it would be impossible for them to last very long, to withstand getting damp, not to mention the occasional spin in the washing machine. On the other hand, if they are made with cotton fibre, they are more robust, flexible and resistant. But that's not all. Cotton is also used in a multitude of objects that we use in our daily lives. Home textiles, coffee filters, shoelaces, and it's even a component of some flat screen TVs. From cotton seeds, an oil is extracted that is used in the production of soaps, margarine and some plastics. Cotton is even used in spacesuits. And here's a fun fact, in 2019, China tried to plant cotton on the far side of the moon. Given the importance of cotton in our lives, it is easier to understand why there are so many countries that grow cotton. There are at least 90 of them, practically half of the world. The main producers are India, China and the United States, and Uncle Sam exports the most cotton to the rest of the world. For its part, the European Union is pretty far behind. The only cotton grown here is in Spain and Greece, and production does not come close to that of other continents. But today we are going to focus on a different region, one where cotton is so important that in relative terms, they are one of the largest producers of this white gold per square kilometre and per inhabitant. We are talking about countries that are so dependent on cotton cultivation that they've even drawn the plant on their national coat of arms. And they also have quite favourable climatic conditions for producing white gold. We're talking about Central Asia, or as we know it, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. You know, the stands. Cotton has a very curious property, because it is a plant that does not tolerate frost. It needs a warm climate, but without exceeding 35 degrees Celsius. In addition, the ideal environment is one where there is little moisture, because during the process of harvesting the cotton, it has to be dry. But at the same time, the plant itself needs a lot of water. For example, to plant 200 grams of cotton, which is what is used to make, let's say, this t-shirt, 2,000 litres of water are needed. Of all the water used in agricultural work, 3.5% goes exclusively to the production of cotton. So now, if you look on a map for a place that is warm, but not too hot, without frost, with a moderately dry climate, but that still has a lot of water, the truth is that you will find that there are quite a few areas with optimal conditions for growing cotton. These days, 73% of the world's cotton is produced thanks to irrigation systems. And that means if you grow a lot of cotton, you use up a lot, and I mean a lot of water. So much that there are regions that are losing their rivers and lakes because of the massive production of white gold. Remember this, because in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you about the biggest water tragedy ever caused by cotton. Having said that, we are not only talking about ecological disasters, but also humanitarian ones. Because there are countries where cotton is harvested by slave labour, or even children. And, what's worse, it is very difficult to know if the t-shirt you are wearing right now is one of the garments made by forced labour, because the cotton supply chain is one of the most complex in the world. I mean, this one could be made by slave labour. <clears throat> so, now I'm going to tell you the story of a dirty slave labour made cotton t-shirt like I've never worn. First, a seed is planted in one of those fields we talked about. Warm, dry and with a lot of water. A few months later, someone has to pick off the typical cotton balls and take them to a ginning factory, where the lint is separated from the seed and any kind of impurities. The cotton lint, which is used in the textile industry, travels to another place, where it is washed and passed through a press to become a block of cotton, which is also called, weirdly, a cake. This goes to the next stage of production, where it is transformed into a yarn. Then comes the weaving or knit process, in which this yarn becomes a fabric. And finally, someone will make our t-shirt, which can then go on display in one of the windows of the major fashion brands. 
Now, everything I have told you could happen in one country, but the truth is that this is not often the case. The most common story is that the cotton is picked in country A, transformed into a fabric in country B, made up in country C, and finally sold in country D. We are talking about a super traditional sector with a very long production chain and a lot of hands through which the cotton weaves its way before becoming a t-shirt. Therefore, at the end of the day, it is very difficult to know who produces the raw cotton used to make, for example, Zara's t-shirts. And I know what you're wondering right now. If cotton is in such high demand, why isn't it picked by machines? It may surprise you, but agriculture is one of the sectors that has changed the most in the last century. Nowadays, almost nobody harvests wheat by hand. Harvesting machines, they do it. So why, in the case of cotton, are children still being used? Well, let's take a look at that right now. The Soviet Trap. Normally, when we talk about the great empires of the world, we think of the British, <laughs> the French, the Spanish colonizers, maybe even the Americans, but not the Russian Empire. Because most of us take it for granted that the Russian Empire is so big because, well, Russia is kind of big. It's as simple as that, right? I think maybe when the countries of the world were dividing up all the lands of the planet, Russia said, give me two, but instead drew the Joker. But the truth is, no. In fact, the great Russian Empire expanded very slowly and only became great as such in the 18th century when they took over all of Siberia. They continued to expand in the south until they reached Central Asia, and that's where they found the perfect place to plant cotton. A warm, dry climate with several rivers to boot. So what's the problem? The problem was that for some reason, they didn't trust the entire population they had just forcibly annexed. You know, colonizer stuff. Besides, like all good colonizers, they thought they were a superior race, and that's why all the production was always in the hands of Russian businessmen. Now, we jump ahead to October 1917. What happened on this date? Exactly. Goodbye Russian Empire, hello Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. At that point, the Communist Party said, now, we are all a brotherhood. We are all comrades. Today for you, tomorrow for me. So, Central Asian Republics, keep planting cotton as if there were no tomorrow. And in return, the rest of the USSR will see to it that you lack nothing. And that helps to explain why Uzbekistan produced two-thirds of all the cotton in the Soviet Union. So you're probably thinking now, well, that's good, right? I mean, what's wrong with Uzbekistan producing a lot of cotton? Well, believe me, it is a problem. You remember that growing cotton requires a lot of water, right? And I mean a lot of water. Well, Uzbekistan is a desert country. So where do they get all the water? The answer is in the Aral Sea. If I ask you to point it out on a map, you had better be pretty quick because it has practically disappeared. That's right, the Aral Sea is one of the largest lakes in the world. Or rather, we should say it was. Check this out. We are talking about one of the largest salt lakes in the world, on the border between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, which, in turn, was fed by several rivers. Well, what the Communist Party did was to say, let's see, here we have the fourth largest lake in the world, with a lot of aquatic life and totally dependent on two rivers. We can divert the water from these rivers to the cotton plantations and see what happens. As you can imagine, when the two rivers stopped filling the Aral Sea, it began to gradually shrink. And at the same time, keep in mind that, as the Soviet Union was the communist country par excellence, all production, including cotton plantations, was in the hands of the state. And what does this mean? Well, those who worked in these fields did not own the land, they did not keep the cotton they picked, and they had to meet very high delivery quotas for cotton. But, on the other hand, the field was not their property, and they could stop managing it at any point that the committee on duty told them to. In conclusion, they had no incentive to invest in machinery. And I know what you're going to tell me now. It's been almost 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union. In fact, Uzbekistan is no longer a Soviet republic, but its own independent country. And yes, you are right. But as far as ownership of the countryside is concerned, the system remains virtually intact. And now I know what you are thinking. In the 1990s, both Uzbekistan and Tajikistan became independent. And yes, you're right. But their economies were designed to export a single product, cotton. Think about it. If depending on oil is problematic, a commodity which has much more demand and fewer producers, imagine what happens if your nation is dependent 
on cotton. From one day to the next, Uzbekistan was competing face to face with the United States and China. They had no technology and no industry that produced anything else. No matter that the countries of Central Asia became independent from the Soviet Union, land ownership remained in the hands of the state. Listen up. The land, its minerals, waters, flora and fauna, other natural resources shall constitute the national wealth and shall be rationally used and protected by the state. Article 55, Constitution of Uzbekistan. Land, its entrails, water, airspace, flora and fauna, and other natural resources shall be owned by the state, and the state guarantee their effective use in the interests of the people. Article 13, Constitution of Tajikistan. That's right. In these countries, the very earth itself belongs to the state. That means that you may be lucky enough to be given a farm, but in return, you will have to plant what the state tells you. So. Once again, it doesn't pay for farmers to make large investments in machinery. But that's not the only reason that harvesting isn't mechanized. Even if it's less efficient, hand-picked cotton pays much better because it's better quality. Just to give you an idea, a kilo of hand-picked cotton pays 16 cents more than machine-picked cotton. In other words, both the United States and Europe machine harvest cotton and can therefore offer more competitive prices than Uzbekistan and the other Central Asian countries. The only way these countries can compete is in the niche market of hand-picked cotton, mostly because there are very very few producers of this type. If we also keep in mind that these producers tend to be wild dictatorships, we find ourselves with barbarities like this. Uzbekistan has second highest prevalence of modern slavery in the world. Euro-Asia net. Every year, up to 2 million people worked on Uzbek cotton plantations against their will and that included children. Basically, September came, and instead of getting out their new textbooks, students and their teachers would take a bus, go to a cotton plantation, and get to work. It may seem incredible to you, but this has been the reality in Uzbekistan until just a couple of years ago. When this came out in the international media, the Uzbek government tried to backpedal a little bit and banned child labourers in the cotton fields, but they didn't do it quite right. Although the children stopped working on the plantations, their teachers still spent September, October and November picking cotton. So what's the outcome? Uzbek children couldn't go to school. So now, the burning question is, so what has happened more recently to change this situation? Why has Uzbekistan banned slavery almost overnight? Well that is what we're going to look at right now. <laughs> The market decides, mate! Look at the label on your possibly dirty slave-made t-shirt, you degenerate. I would never wear such a thing. I'm sure it doesn't say made in Uzbekistan. It probably says something like made in Turkey or made in Bangladesh. And you'll say, what? Why are they lying to us? As is always the case, the answer is complex. Do you remember the cotton production chain we talked about before, which is one of the longest and most complex in the world? And what if I told you that the country that imports the most cotton from countries like Turkmenistan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan is Turkey? And in turn, Turkey is one of those countries where companies like Nike or H&M have their textile factories. Now, it should begin to make sense. Indeed, Turkey is one of the largest cotton hubs in Europe. It receives the raw material from Central Asia and converts it into clothing or sends fabric to large textile factories in other countries. It is almost impossible to trace where the cotton in your t-shirt comes from. However, I'm sure none of you would buy a t-shirt knowing that slave labor has been involved. I certainly wouldn't. Of course, there's already a huge debate around companies outsourcing to countries with cheap labour. But no one, absolutely no one, defends the use of slavery. And some will think, the multinationals don't care about enslaving anyone if it means making money. And, though sometimes that's true, consumers don't think the same way. And neither do NGOs, nor, most importantly, the courts. So, what is the solution? Well, on the one hand, quality seals. Right now, there are a lot of agencies that oversee cotton production and only put the seal on finished items if no children or slaves have been involved in production. And that explains news like this. Uzbekistan. Over 100 companies eschew Uzbek cotton. Euro-Asia net. Indeed. This is what happened in 2012. Suddenly, Uzbekistan lost almost all of its buyers. And we're not just talking about companies here, we're talking about governments. 
EU lawmakers block textile deal with Uzbekistan over child labor concerns. RFERL. So suddenly, Uzbekistan became the golem of countries. Small, despised, and obsessed with its precious cotton. But not only that, Uzbekistan needed to reduce its dependence on cotton. For example, they needed to start growing wheat so they wouldn't have to import it. On the other hand, if they wanted to continue selling cotton, they had no choice but to leave slavery behind. And that explains why. Since 2012, the country has been reforming its policies. First, they stopped forcing children to grow and pick cotton. Then, they stopped enslaving officials. And we're not just talking about a superficial change here. According to the International Labour Organization, which is not exactly friendly to the Uzbek government, 94% of the people who were picking cotton in 2019 did so voluntarily. Of course, that still means there is 6% of slave labour. But remember that we are talking about changing a system that has sustained the entire national economy for decades. And now, I know what you're thinking about what we were thinking about what you thought before. Uzbekistan has no technology, and now they have no slaves, how can they be competitive in the marketplace? The answer lies in the root of the problem. Why are there no tractors in Uzbekistan? Exactly, because there is no private initiative. So it's time to change the rules of the game. Uzbekistan to start land privatization next year. As China faces U.S. forced labor sanctions, Uzbekistan becomes a model. Forbes. And now I know what you're thinking about what you were thinking about what you thought before what you thought before. Come on, Grant. Is a dictatorship as corrupt as the Uzbek one really going to sell off their fields transparently? And on that one, you are absolutely right. The privatization of Uzbek cotton is anything but squeaky clean. And also, the laws are pretty confusing. So what they've actually done has been to seed the cultivation of the cotton fields and then the processing of it to private entrepreneurs, one for each region. In other words, each of these entrepreneurs has a monopoly on cotton in their region. And without a doubt, the greatest beneficiary of all this privatization is a local company called Uztex. We are talking about the largest conglomerate in Uzbekistan, and one that has very clear connections with the government. This company has taken over crops from most of the regions. But, to be honest, corruption is nothing the poor Uzbeks don't already know about. Now, at least, they are starting to see farm machinery in their fields. Listen up. Uzbekistan to speed up mechanization of cotton picking. Uz daily. But wait just one moment. If you thought that privatizing the countryside was enough to end slavery once and for all, you are very much mistaken. Many of these factories are having trouble finding labor. So think about this. Before, it was as simple as forcing everyone to pick cotton. Now they have to get used to making work contracts. And in many cases, some of these private farms are turning to local authorities to get people back to work. Remember that we are still talking about a dictatorship where there is no rule of law. Even today, many local politicians can use the police to enslave the population. On the other hand, independent contracted workers do not have enviable conditions either. At the moment, the going rate for a cotton picker is about two and a half euros a day. This is a low wage even by Uzbek standards. However, the Uzbekistan of 2020 is much fairer than that of 2012. More importantly, all of these new landowners are starting to invest in cotton pressing technology. Today, 70% of the countryside of Uzbekistan is already in private hands and is starting to use agricultural machinery. But not only that, all these new landowners, especially those belonging to the Uztex group, are starting to invest in cotton processing factories. In other words, in a few years, Uzbekistan could stop exporting raw cotton and start selling higher value added products such as cotton yarn or even clothing. Do you think that the Uzbek reforms are a good example for other cotton producing countries? Do you think that international sanctions could be more effective now against slave labor in Xinjiang? And do you think that I was ever wearing a t-shirt? Because you are mistaken, it was always just this silk shirt. Leave your answer in the comments. As always, we really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos every week. Don't forget to check out our friends also at the Reconsider Media Podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not my dulcet tones. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you next time. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.